I think it was on the podcast with Addison Edmonds uh, from Gunner Kennels where we dipped off into the world of German dogs a little bit. And I mentioned my experience with a draught and uh, I, I don't even really hardly remember it, but apparently the listeners were paying attention because lots of people have reached out to me and said, yeah. hey, man, what do you got against German breeds? And it, I don't have anything against any of them. I... Uh, my one experience hunting over a drought was not so great. And uh, you reached out to me about that. And you're like, man, I've been working with these dogs a long time. And uh, you're, you're pretty into them, huh? Yeah. I mean, they're by far my favorite dog. I've had labs and short hairs, but I've been with the draughts for uh, a little over five years, six years now. So, and it's, that's, that's important to note because you're, you're a dog trainer out there and, Dickinson, North Dakota, and you've, you've trained a fair amount of dogs in your life. You've, you've worked with a lot of dogs, you've hunted with a lot of dogs, and you can definitively say that draughts are your go-to breed now. Yes, absolutely. Why? They can do anything. I mean, I can go out and I can waterfowl hunt in the morning. I can point pheasants in the afternoon and blood track a deer at night. I mean, they'll, they'll just do it all. And, you know, the whole Jack of trades, master of none is something that some people kind of coin to them. But I've, I mean, I've got some that I'd put them up against any English pointer and they'll point just as good, but they'll so, retrieve a bird that drops on the other side of the river too. So, yeah. So they, they can handle water just fine. And, the, and, you know, the versatility aspect and you and I, you know, when we chatted on the phone the other night, we got into that that's a German breed. And over there they look at dogs. They don't, it's not just bird dogs, Mm -hmm. you know, it's game recovery. Um, it's there, there's a lot more going on and, and I, not to say they give their dogs more credit, but it's generally in the culture more accepted to say this dog that I own while it can point upland birds and it can retrieve waterfowl. It could also hunt wild boars. It can, it, it can find the deer that you gut shoot. They, they have a lot more roles and they expect a lot more of their dogs over there. And so you're talking about a dog breed that comes from a place where they ask a lot of them. Yeah. I mean, over there to just to deer hunt, you have to have access to a game recovery dog. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I mean, we're incredibly blessed in America with the amount of game that we have to hunt. Um, through the breed, I've talked to, you know, a fair amount of Germans and, you know, they just don't have near as much game to hunt, whether it's birds, waterfowl, you know, it's, they put a huge emphasis on after the shot because anything you shoot, you need to recover. Is that because there's a price tag attached to it? Do you know? On the animal? Yeah. Or... I don't think so. I think it's just because just the culture. They, yeah. I mean, they put a high value on like, you know, we only have X amount of birds or something, you know, whatever game you're after, you know, we have a, a small amount. So whatever it is we shoot, we need to find. Mm-hmm. So, so they, their emphasis, uh, you know, leans a little heavily toward, uh, ensuring the best chance of recovery and yeah. you know you and i know that a dog is a way to do that versus you know our our best efforts are not that good <laughs> compared to theirs yeah and so i mean that's that is uh, we you know we get into the european thing a lot with dogs and talking about breeds and british labs and and their breed standards versus our breed standards and it's it's interesting because here we have we have the land to hunt. We have tons of public land. We have tons of opportunities. Like you mentioned, we don't really have any breeding standards. That's, that's, up. <laughs> no. you know, if you, if you want a good dog, that's on you, brother. Like you got to go research pedigrees, bloodlines. You got to find the right one. Then you either got to train it or you got to have somebody such as yourself train it over there. That's the different part to it. Um, and so th- there's, there's things to be learned from both sides, but when you, when you got exposed to these draughts, like what, what was the thing where you're like, I'm, I'm checking these dudes out. I'm going to see if this is, this is something I want to own or I want to train. What happened there? So at the time I had a lab and a short hair and, uh, I worked with a buddy that he was the one that got me into short hairs and, you know, we worked together. We were, we were around each other a lot and, you know, he showed up to work one day. He's like, man, I've got, 
I found the end all beat all dog. You know, it will do everything. I was like, ah, I don't think so. And, you know, he went on and he's like, yeah, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to get one. And so he, he bought one. Once again, I wasn't very, I mean, I was impressed with it. I'm like, yeah, you know, I mean, it's cool dog. It's ugly as I'll get out. It's hairy and goofy looking, but you know, whatever. But then we went on a pig hunt down in Texas and I mean, it just, you know, the, the guide was like, well, first off my, my friend had been like, Hey, you know, I'd really like to use these dogs. You know, they hunt pigs in Germany with them. I'd like to see what they'll do here. You know, they've never been trained or anything, just whatever. And the guy just laughed. He's like, man, your dogs are going to die. Like these pigs are mean. He's like, well, my dogs, if they die, oh well. And so, you know, we cut those dogs loose and uh, we had already had hounds out searching for pigs. And all of a sudden my buddy's dog just sounds off over here and he start baying. And he's like, oh, that's bull. That's my dog over there. And so we went running over there and sure enough, it had a little, you know, like 40 ish pound pig pinned up against the fence, just barking at it. And I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. You know, my lab probably would not do that. Um, and you know, then, you know, we're yelling, Hey, you know, get the, get the catch dogs over here. And out of nowhere, the other dog that knew that dog pretty well, cause they had hunted together a lot and he heard the same bark. So he came running over and I mean, that dog just boom plows right into that pig and killed it. And at that point, I mean, it sealed the deal. I was like, that's dog for me. I want one of those. Um, so to put that into perspective, now you say, you know, you say a 40 pound pig, that's not a very big pig, but no. at the same time, if you took the top MMA fighter heavyweight in the world and put him in a cage with a 40 pound wild pig, the pig would probably win. <laughs> that is not like just saying that like wild animal strength and ferocity is crazy and we witness it when we're out hunting and you see it and you can get glimpses of it with dogs sometimes sometimes but you don't you know in a general pet ownership way you don't see your dog's full fighting potential come out and so it may sound like not that big of a deal oh a 40 pound pig whatever like that's not that's no joke to 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 swing in there quick and send that pig to the to to the you know the rooting grounds in the sky that's no joke so that's that's impressive toughness And I mean, you know, kind of on that same line we had, so we were using catch dogs that were Dogo Argentinos and we had lots of pigs that were in that like 80 to a hundred pound range. And those Dogos are right around a hundred to 120 pounds. And that 80 pound pig would literally just fling the Dogo off of it. Like it was a rag doll, you know? So they're pretty impressive they're t- yeah and a draught's not a very big dog i mean it's yeah, I mean, we, what are they running 50 pounds maybe in between 50 and 70 that okay, one that killed it was about 60 65 so, so they're they're you know typically like the the size of a real athletic lab like the the 50 to 70 pound range is what you see an awful lot of good sporting dogs end up in the ones yeah. that have the athleticism that'll take them through life. You know, you can find the big beast dogs, but they, you know, yep. sometimes you can run into trouble with them with joints and stuff. So they're, so they're right in there and size wise. So what else was it? Cause I know as a trainer, you're looking at this differently than somebody who might just be sitting at home going, you know, I love to hunt ducks and pheasants. Maybe I should get a, you know, get one of these dogs. Like what else was it for you besides that versatility? Like when you started working with them, was it, was there something training wise where you're like, man, I like this. I mean, with any dog you're going to have, or with any dog breed, you're going to have some that have brains and just some that are idiots. Um, (laughs) it's true so um, what, just the listeners Rhett said that not me <laughs> so the hate mail needs to go his way not mine yeah go ahead and just bring it on <laughs> so anyway go ahead um but you know and the more i got to be around the dogs because so i had been around and exposed to the dogs for about three years before i actually got one mm-hmm. and it just seemed you didn't run into near as many numbskulls um and going back to where you where you had previously talked about the breeding standards. Mm -hmm. You know, if you've got a dog and I've got a dog, I mean, pick your breed. We could have puppies if we wanted. 
with a draw har, you've got one and I've got one. You've taken it through three different hunting tests and a coat and confirmation test. I've done the same thing and then we can breed it. Like it. So, I mean, just out of the gate, you are guaranteed to have just a, you know, a higher probability of a better dog. Yep. You know? Um, and so, you know, we've, we've been down this road a million times on this podcast and we're going to go a million more because I, when I think about what I want to accomplish with this, one of the things I want is to convince people that they need to understand pedigree and bloodlines. Like it, you don't need to be an expert on it, but if you want a good dog, you need to understand how important that is. And so what you're saying is your exposure to these draughts was you were, you were exposed to intelligent athletic dogs first off. And the reason that you weren't running into the numbskulls is because of how the ones that are allowed to breed have to be able to perform. Yeah. It's sim it's you know, on paper, it's simple. That's why, you know, but if you go out look at a litter of puppies, like you don't want to do that until you know what's in those puppies. Because if you look at the puppies, you're gonna be like, Oh, this one's loaded with potential. It's adorable. Doesn't yeah. mean anything. Absolutely. So that's, that's interesting. But so my question there is I would assume that if you were dealing with dogs that were exported from Germany or, you know, imported from Germany, I guess I should say, I would, but are you talking dogs that were bred here in the States? Any draw har has to go through that, oh, that okay. type of standard. It is. So Who, group, who's governing that? So you've got the Varian Deutsch draw har is, so you, you've got your AKC, right? Mm -hmm. The AKC has nothing to do with the draw hars. Um, they've got their own group called the VDD and that way they can be the sole governing body of, you know, this is allowed. This is what we expect. You've got to do this period. Mm -hmm. Um, and so within the VDD North America is a group. So you've got our group is VDD GNA, Varian Deutsch Strathard group, North America. You've got group Canada, Within Germany, they've got a few different groups. I don't know how many, but that is the governing body. And within each group, you've got a breed warden. So your dog passed the test, my dog passed the test. And then we have to talk to the, I mean, you basically talk to the breed warden and he is the one that, you know, he fills out all the paperwork and everything like that, that, you know, ensures the dog is what it is. Mm -hmm. So, so as you explain this and it coming from a dog trainer's perspective, now I understand why somebody like you would be drawn to that breed. It's, you know, anywhere, but especially in this country where lots of breeding for different sporting dogs is just wild, wild west, go nuts, yeah. whatever. Uh, but this one is different. It's, it's being held to a higher standard. Yeah. Another bunch of letters. So there's the JGHV. And it's a German word. I couldn't even try to say it right. Um, <laughs> but they've, so you've got the draw hars, which have that standard. And then there's a few other groups that all test under those same standards. Mm -hmm. Like you've got a long har, a stitzel har, um, a kurtzar, and then poodle pointers. And there's one other one I'm missing. Um, Oh, and your Munsterlanders, like your Klein Munsterlander. Um, but the the DDs kind of have the biggest presence, and they're the most popular as far as in America goes. So, uh, out of all of those those breeds, I mean, the Drots are what I hear about the most, um, probably because they're they're that's probably the breed that's most likely to end up in the hunting and game recovery circles. Uh, it's so I still want to get into, I, I, I get the breeding behind it. I get, I get why you'd be drawn to that. I understand that. I understand the versatility, but I'm mm -hmm. always interested in like the personality because once you, once you start breaking down <clears throat> golden retrievers versus Labrador retrievers versus GSPs or whatever, you start to find trainers that are drawn to certain dog personality well, they all love performance. Yeah. Uh, but what's like in your experience, 
you know, are they soft? Can you be a little hard on them? Can you run them all day? What What are they like? The majority of them are a little bit harder. Um, you know, I mean, you can, so with the testing that, you know, that just brings in kind of the trainability slash and just what they expect out of the dog at a younger age, which means generally you can put a little bit more pressure on the dog sooner. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, like we were just at a test and it's, it's the spring puppy test where, you know, you've got to have your dog already able to track rabbits, point birds, and then just cooperate and be searching a field for you. Um, Mm -hmm. and that's done the following spring after the puppy's born. You know, so you've still got a really yep. young dog that's expected to do all that. Within the breed, you'll, I mean, you can still end up with some that are a little bit soft. Um, but, I mean, of the three I've owned, I mean, all of them, you know, I could have them. I forget about them in the house a lot. You know, you can just, you put them on their beds and they'll just lay there. They're yep. quiet. They don't whine. They're not bugging you. But then as soon as you tell them, you know, let's go, it they turn it on and start burning up the field. So they got a, they got a good off switch. Um, do you think, I mean, this is my, maybe more of a general dog question, but I'm, I'm obsessed with this idea that our dogs in general are capable of so much more than we ask of them. Like I, I think about this, you know, I don't know if you know Tom Dockin or not. I work with Tom a lot and I'm always amazed at what he's, he's like, you know, take that seven week old puppy, do this with it, do that with it. Some of the, some of the really good trainers I know, well, they're just trying to get everything out of them. Shed dogs, the, you know, everything you can do. And we we're seeing more and more, like now these dogs are becoming adventure dogs too. And they're riding a kayak with you or yeah. they're therapy dogs, or, you know, they can sniff out, you know, a diabetic seizure coming on. And I think, you know, in general, and maybe I'm wrong here, but it sounds like you feel the same way that we just like, there's a lot more we could be asking of them and we just need to ask the right questions. And these, these good dogs will deliver. That last part's the trick. I, you know, I think if you've got a well-bred smart dog, I mean, the possibilities are endless on what you can do with them, you know? And so that let's clarify this quick here before we get too crazy. When, when we talk about, you know, being hard on them or soft on them, you know, it's not like you're out there hitting them with a lead pipe. You're just asking a lot of them. Yeah. You're not hitting them with a re- lead pipe, right? <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, okay. You know, uh, just, I just want to clarify that. But so <laughs> when we say, I, I think I see this a lot where I think it's really easy to think, oh, I got this puppy. I've got to be soft on it, which means not asking it to do anything or learn anything. That's not how they're wired. A good one, like you no. said, with with the right genes in it, that dog wants to work. It thrives off a of structure. It thrives off of being asked to do tasks and that like confidence building drills. Yeah. And so it's easy for us to be like, oh, this puppy's cute. I'm not going to really train it yet. But the reality is being hard on a dog as we we're framing it is just asking them to do a lot and, and taking their temperature. You know, if they're not ready, you can't push it. Uh, yeah. But you got to understand what they're capable of. Well, so, I mean, I, I had my first litter in November. All of the, there was 10 puppies, all 10 of those puppies before I sent them home would I could take a coon hide and drag it through my yard, you know, for uh, it was probably about 80, 80 to a hundred yards. Then I'd stick that dog on there and it'd, it'd track it out. And then I could take a bumper and, you know, toss it and retrieve it. And this is all happening at like five or six weeks old. You know I mean? So that's kind of going back to the, you're not necessarily being hard on them. You're just expecting a lot out of them. Yep. Yep. So, and, and yeah. And so that's a, uh... Maybe it's maybe it's just the wrong way to phrase that, but the reality is, um, there you you know it's the same thing. I always I kind of always talk about like raising kids, right? Like it it might not be my kids might not like it right away if I'm like, hey, you got to eat your broccoli, but they yeah. need that, you know, absolutely. And, and they if if they eat their broccoli, then they get to play and do something cool. Then they're like, oh, that's that good. Yeah. That thing that's good for me is worth it. 
and puppies are the same way. Like you, yeah. you, you ask them the right questions, you dangle the right carrot in front of them and they're going to be like, yeah, this is what I'm here to do. And yeah. I just, we don't, you know, you're talking about puppies that aren't, haven't even gone home yet. So you're talking about puppies that aren't even, or gone to their homes, you know? So you're talking the under seven week crowd, which is a young dog, but yeah. capable of learning, capable yeah. of getting le- like little, little lessons, but still there. Yeah. They're just little sponges. They just soak everything up. Yeah. It's so hmm. when, when you say that you, uh, you just had your first litter uh, in, and you're in the breeding game now, then um, what's the demand like for these dogs? I am far from being in the breeding game. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> no. Was it an accidental um, litter or what? Oh no, it was, it was totally, it was completely intentional. Um, but I mean, like you, within the club, you know, you'll have people that'll turn out, you know, two or three litters a year. I mean, if I get one every two years, that's going to be just fine with me. But I mean, they're, depending on where you're at, there's a lot more breeders or a lot less. I mean, it was funny. So I've lived in North Dakota for eight years now. And I mean, it's bird country. Like you would expect there to be a fair number of bird dog breeders up here. And when I, so I moved up here from Utah and there's way more breeders for draughts down there than there is up here. Um, and when I first got into them, I mean, I was on a waiting list for about a year and now I don't, I mean, there's, there's certain breeders that will still have a waiting list, but then, mm-hmm. I mean, if you just, I mean, if you're just looking to get a drop puppy, you can pretty well find one especially in the springtime, they're pretty popular to get bred then. So 